Hello, this is Dan Brown. I'm here today again with another A Lens a Day Conversations about Information Architecture. And today I get to talk to the sparkling Eduardo Ortiz. Eduardo, old friend, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so, uh, I'm so glad that we get, uh, to talk. You really, um, I've watched your career, uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, and I've really come to appreciate, uh, what you're doing, um, with Coforma and, um, uh, and the, the kind of user experience work that you get to do, uh, in the civic, uh, space, uh, obviously that space is ripe with information architecture, uh, problems. Um, I would uh, struggle, I think, personally, to focus in that space. And I think I would struggle to focus because it feels like the ocean needs boiling, right? It feels like there's just so much to do. How do you help your clients or your teams get their arms around the core problem? How do you, when you're kind of dealing with an information architecture mess, how do you help people kind of focus on what's important? Uh, so <laughs> you're completely right. Uh, I, the, the easiest way to, to, to answer that question is uh, by like standing on the shoulders of Jeff. Uh, there's a lot of work that has been done by, uh, by folks in the federal space that have created a series of artifacts that have become almost like canon and that people respect because of how they were done. Uh, there was uh, one, uh, one bit of work that was done by Marianne Brody and uh, uh, Emily uh, Tabularis uh, when they were with the US Studio Service uh, researching, doing usability testing with veterans. Uh, they created some videos. Uh, I've used that often in order to show clients uh, and partners why it is important that we do usability testing, that we actually try our tools that we are creating in our solutions with real people that are going to be impacted. Uh, I've uh, often, uh, uh, and I was saying to you, this to you before getting, before you started recording, I've used your tools of surviving plan projects with clients in order to help them uh, talk through the problems that we were seeing and uh, come up with uh, a number of different approaches, uh, but mostly to help them understand that there is no one size fits all to solve to solve the problem. In the federal government, unfortunately, you see that uh, their work most often is done by the vendor who can uh, speak the loudest, who has the most relationships, uh, and you end up with a lot of work that abides by agile principles that uses uh, the latest uh, technologies, but that never launches because it doesn't actually meet the use needs. So what I do is I try to leverage all of these tools that have become kind of like part of my toolbox in order to help uh, my clients, my partners, uh, prioritize and to identify what needs to be done first. Once that has been set, then we can start actually carving out and defining what are the boundaries of what needs to be done and uh, what are the ways in which uh, it can be achieved. Uh, that's great. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, so much about information architecture is really about prioritization and really under, like trying to um, work together to really understand what's important. Um, and my, my hope is, uh, as a field, we shun practices that prioritize the loudest voices, right? I personally don't have a very loud voice. So I like the idea of using methods that give everyone at the table uh, a voice. Are there particular, let's call them IA specific tools that are in your toolbox? Are there, are there kind of activities or methods that deal specifically with understanding uh, structure that deals specifically with understanding categorization uh, or navigation or things like that? Yeah, so uh, to your point, I'll, I'll just share one thing. I've gotten into this thing that I have not researched, and I'm sure that I learned it from someone at some point, 
but I've started to modify a lot of the methodologies and approaches uh, that I use uh, by introducing new modalities. Uh, and what that is, is I'll say like, for this specific exercise or for this uh, specific activity, you cannot talk or you have to do this thing together or you have to uh, assign one person to speak for the group and or you have to do it in X or Y or Z fashion. And that has led to a lot of success in order to try to help quiet the loudest uh, uh, voice in, in the room, uh, specifically when you're doing exercises where people have to talk to one another, when you force people to or when you encourage people to write things down and to express them in written form, all of a sudden that, that tends to change the conversation and tends to bring a little bit of, of more uh, uh, equity and uh, normalcy to, to the relationship there. Uh, but the, the tools that are in my toolbox are, that I primarily use for, for, um, for structure are almost always, they are just generative sessions uh, uh, such as, um, uh, the the KJ uh, methodology or affinity mapping. Uh, <clears throat> I can't develop the structure without prioritizing it. So a lot of like dot voting uh, uh, happens uh, in order to like create uh, specific structures. Uh, card sorting, uh, doing both like doing all such as uh, open, close, and and mix, uh, and just like kind of like stepping through them. Uh, if it is something that is completely brand new. We're probably going to start with open. If it is something that we're trying to improve, probably going to start with close. Uh, and if it is something that we have a little bit more leeway on, then we are kind of going to explain how this will go into the mix. But those are probably where uh, most of the of the of the work happens when creating structure. Uh, oftentimes, though, we will try to create structure ahead of the, that by doing generative research and by doing interviews and taking the synthesis uh, and synthesizing the the interviews and trying to extrapolate what it is that we are kind of like understanding and then bringing that to uh, to a uh, affinity mapping or KJ uh, kind of like work session and just getting people to be like, yep, this actually makes sense or actually I would change this or actually what that actually means is this thing, uh, especially in the federal government. The one thing that you're, that you quickly realize is that like, when you think that you know, you're probably wrong. There are uh, people that have been in the federal government for decades. Uh, it's not uncommon to find someone that has been in the federal government for 20 years, 30 years, and <clears throat> they are the most knowledgeable, amazing, and dedicated people to work with. And when you find someone like that who can literally be like your guide uh, across what is often a mess of regulations, policies, laws, uh, and just things that have popped up because they needed to do the work. It's just absolutely amazing what you can create. That's awesome. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's such a double-edged sword. You know, the government has this reputation of people going there and stay, staying there forever. And on the one hand, uh, obviously that civil service is, admirable. And on the other hand, it can be, it has a reputation uh, for being fraught. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I love the fact that for you, that means there's a certain amount of knowledge and expertise uh, there. And that's, a, that's an opportunity, right? That's a, a goal for folks like us. That is a goldmine uh, of, of information. But I wanted to come back to some of the tools that you mentioned um, especially when using it with folks like we've just been talking about, it, it, it's amazing to me that something like a card sort has lasted. I mean, I was, I was hearing about that back in the nineties, right? We were talking about card sorts. So these tools have really lasted the test of time. I, I mean, this is not a fair question, but why do you think that is? Like, what is it about these tools that, in your experience, are so powerful uh, that they've that we've used them essentially for decades for this kind of work? And the affinity mapping, I use that all the time. I don't know what I would do without it, and yet it consistently delivers value. So, what is it about those tools? Do you think that are so useful? Yeah, 
Yeah, so I've actually been able to kind of like think through that quite a bit in the past few years. And there are a, a few things. First and foremost is that they are ridiculously easy to explain. Number two, you can run an affinity math or a card sorting with almost anything. You have uh, you have chalk and a and a chalkboard. Do you have uh, um, <clears throat> do you have a uh, whiteboard and erasable markers? Do you have posters? Like you can literally do this in anything. Microsoft Excel, Trello, Asana, GitHub. Literally, you can do any of these exercises in any tool. Like the tool doesn't matter whatsoever. Like the process is what is what is what is what is key um and the fact that people are able to see things right then and there that there's no like okay we're gonna go back and then we'll come we'll come to you and tell you what we found it's like no no no. people can see it and you're able to immediately on the spot ask questions interrogate what you are seeing like that has a lot of value and especially when you are doing this uh as a group when the exercise itself engenders conversations and questions and gets people to all of a sudden get to agreement. That is like fantastic. Uh, one of the, the things that I love, love to use affinity mapping for, it's not really to do affinity mapping, it's mostly to engender trust between groups that don't like working with each other. Because I mix the groups, but I also make the groups present to one another. And all of a sudden you see someone that was in a group that doesn't like another, be like, well, actually, no, taking the position of, a, of the team that they didn't like. And you see them all of a sudden be like, wait, we're all speaking to the same thing. And when you get them to understand the language, because I think that that's often what, like, for me, like the Cajun method or Fender mapping, sorry, I keep switching between two, uh, does is, is just that. It helps people understand where each other is coming from. And I, think that that is like just uh, absolutely great. And the whole like presenting to one another, I actually stole that from uh, Todd Saku Warfel in probably like 2008 or 2009, uh, something like my dad when, yeah. So I just, just to give him credit. <laughs> I, find, I find, um, actually one of my favorite parts of doing these interviews, uh, is, um, the name dropping, like, it really just speaks to how connected uh, the community is, um, which I find moving. Um, and um, I also find moving what you just said. Um, one of the things you said, one of the things that I love to use affinity mapping for is that it engenders trust among groups that don't normally get along. And I think this is such a revealing uh, theme of user experience work in general, um, that for some reason, the act of trying to design a product is also the act that compels organizations um, to talk to each other. Um, and I just feel like that is, to me, that is such uh, important work. Um, and the fact that we can sort of build a very quick bridge between the tools that we use and that aspiration, uh, I think, just speaks volumes uh, to the kind of work that information architects are trying to do. Um, I usually try and make a very clever transition to talking about the lens, but uh, we are in one place and the lens is in a different place. Um, so here we are. Um, can I ask you to say what lens uh, we zeroed in on for you and uh, maybe describe it in your own words would that be okay yeah of course so we chose burden nice and burden is uh the tldr to it is that like, the navigation cannot do everything for everyone all of the time uh and as i'm saying that i had this visual for like wait is this why faceted navigation came into vogue uh, <laughs> uh uh, yeah. So, what are you going to tell you about this? About this lens? Well, so the way 
for me, the way I, the reason why I wrote this lens is um, I often work on projects where we're just looking at the navigation, uh, for example. And as you know, when you even when you look at the navigation, what you're really looking at is lots and lots of other aspects of the the product and the organization, right? The navigation is just an excuse. Um, but because the scope of my projects are just the navigation, uh, there's an expectation that we can solve all the problems that we uncover with new navigation. And as much as I love navigation and as much as I believe in a solid navigation menu, I also recognize that there's only so much we can do in the nav. So maybe you can tell us a story of doing some design work where everyone was like, okay, we'll just throw that in the nav or, or even not necessarily a navigation issue, but we'll just throw that in an FAQ or like where people are trying to burden one part of the product with way more responsibility than it deserves. Um, I mean, another way of looking at this is you've done such a great job thinking through the kinds of tools that you use do we try and burden our tools with too much? Do we try and expect too much out of the, the tool itself? A KJ, as you point out, is not going to solve all of our problems. It solves important ones, but it doesn't solve all of them. I wonder if you can sort of tell us a story about a, a time in your career or recent project where everyone was trying to get something to do more than it was able to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can I can speak to, to both things. I'll I'll tell you like a quick story that uh, helped me to also become like a better a better practitioner and to uh, be more transparent and honest with with those that that, that I work with. Uh, I was running uh, at, at KJ with um, with a group of folks in a, in a state government, and th these two groups didn't trust each other. So I first uh, had them uh, run part of the KJ. Uh, and do the and present to to each team. Obviously, they were coming from two different things. Then I mixed them up, had them do the same exercise, uh, and they all of a sudden started talking to one another. And by the end of it, they were like, "This this is great." Uh, so what is the next step? And I was like, "Well, actually, I just wanted you all to work together." And that led to some really strong feedback from them for how I had deceived them. Uh, and how uh, they like it, it, it's not what I was trying to, to achieve because I wasn't clear about what was the intent there. Uh, so, it's, so it's helped me uh, in my career to be more honest and transparent. Uh, on, the, on the navigation or presentation of, of information, uh, I've definitely been derelict in my duty uh, by being one of those that is like, well, we can just do the login behind a reveal function. Uh, they'll put their mouse over it, and then it drops down, and then they log in there. Uh, and as I've grown, I've learned, like, well, so that may work on desktop for sighted people that are fully able. Uh, when you start talking about uh, non-sighted or you start talking about assistive, uh, any kind of assistive technology, all of a sudden that function doesn't work. So now we have to build more things and more things. So it, what I found is that like, when you try to get too quote unquote smart or nouveau with the navigation patterns and what a navigation does, you often, it's not just, you don't just burden the navigation, which in, tend, which in, in turn burdens uh, those people that are trying to use your tool, but you end up burdening your team, right? Because <clears throat> over time, that is going to come back. as like, okay, this is why people are not able to get to X, Y, Z. This is what, what is leading to more calls. This is what is whatever. Uh, and, you know, like, this is, this is like the perfect scenario that you see all too often where companies decide to, to bury the, the contact information so that people don't call. They're like, well, it's on the website. And they bury it two or three layers deep under about us uh, or about the organization. And then uh, these are the ways that we can help you. And so why would you do that? Because all of a sudden what it does is it leads people away from you. Uh, and in a lot of cases, such as in the federal government, whenever an organization tries this, what it does is it actually leads to more calls to call centers 
that don't even handle whatever the issue is because all of their numbers are uh, listed on the internet. So people will just use their favorite search engine to be like, how do I call agency X? Uh, and that to me is like some of the ways in which I've seen this less kind of like necessary. I guess I see a, a little bit more holistic and like it affects everyone. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I got to uh, visit your agency a couple of years ago when you guys uh, did, and were when you all did all hands, and I was really impressed with um, just kind of the range of designer backgrounds uh, that you had uh, uh, in your group. Um, I had so much fun uh, coming and chatting with uh, you all and meeting meeting all those cool uh, folks. Um, what occurs to me though, I think, um, is, uh, um, and I, I don't know anything about the specifics of your folks, but when I see kind of uh, people coming from lots of different design areas, I wonder, uh, do they have the same exposure to information architecture challenges, right? Um, do they have, uh, and we, I see this um, when I'm um, uh, working with uh, designers who are newer to the field, right? The the level of exposure to information architecture stuff is uh, is not as great. Um, they just uh, the nature of our work these days is things have to move fast, whereas IA wants to be more slow and deliberate. Or um, there is an emphasis on the visual presentation and not the underlying structure. How do you uh, coach? your team or newer designers, uh, or even maybe folks who are stuck in the government who have not had the opportunity, I shouldn't say stuck in the government, but folks who are employed by the government who haven't had the opportunity to do this kind of deep thinking about structure. How do you coach those kinds of folks in uh, bringing an IA mindset to bear on their work? What advice would you have for folks like that? Um, so probably that advice for for folks that are that haven't had the experience, but more advice for folks that are in a position that they need to coach or they need to help others understand it. The first thing that I do is I get rid of jargon. Uh, it is the one equalizer that I have. Uh, I don't speak to the KJA method. I talk about we're going to do a, a taking note exercise. I don't speak to uh, we're going to do card sorting. I say that we're going to work with index cards. Uh, I don't say that we're going to do a, a tree jack exercise. I say, let's figure out if uh, we can actually find, if people can find where to go when in our navigation. And it's all about like simplifying what we are presenting in a way, almost like reducing the cognitive burden in this case, that not having 20 years of experience in this field and being exposed to people like you has afforded me uh, hats on top of other people, right? Because to your point, I have seen newer designers in the space who, because of where they grew up, the work that they have done, they don't know about uh, JJG's uh, uh, work. Uh, they don't know what micro interactions are. So like that, and now I'm totally just like, name dropping for the hell of it. Uh, but one thing that they can quickly understand is that if we use common language, people can get it and people can, can, can interact. And that's where I have found that we have had the most success is by making sure that everyone can take part. Eduardo, we're going to leave it right there. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dan. Really appreciate it. This was great.